Um, if you'd come early, you would have been able to take part in the entertainment that Stephanie arranged um, and that I participated in. We did some stretching. Um, and there's some pictures. But I thought it was also worth having a look to see what's been going on with any tweets that people have been tweeting in the last few days. Last night, I went to the King's Road, and I had my first experience of hiring a Boris bike. Has anybody ever done that? It's really, really fun, um, and it doesn't cost anything. And I cycled all the way from the King's Road, through Sloan Square, past Buckingham Palace, Tottenham Court Road, and then that little walk that I did, um, you remember I told you that I, well, I documented a story of a walk that I shared with you in the first week, that we then found last week was the very same path that Oliver Twist and the Artful Dodger had walked um, from Charles Dickens uh, up to um, the Angel. There we are. That's where I cycled. So I cycled 5.4 miles, and Google told me that it should have taken 39 minutes, but actually I took about an hour and a half because I kept stopping all the way along the way to take pictures. And um, so you can see some of the pictures that I took. I took some pictures of how I hired the bike. And uh, there's one about Sloan Square so there. It says, um, it's a long time since I got out west to Sloan Square, and it will be interesting to do some studying London as I travel north and east. Um, Ubers, cheek by jowl with hackney carriages, a sign of the impact of the digital economy and tensions that exist in the city. I just thought that's quite interesting. Everywhere I went last night around Sloan Square, there were white Ubers, white, what are they called, Priuses, and then hackney cabs. And I just thought, you know, there's such tension, isn't there? Are you aware of that around that part of the economy? And it's driven significantly by... Um, digital technology. So it kind of, you know, for me, I thought that was quite interesting because it reminded me of the fact that in this, um, in this module, we're thinking about digital skills and digital literacy. We're thinking about the city. We're thinking about social transformations. I think that a lot is wrapped up in, in that story of what's happening with a kind of traditional industry and a new digital industry. A few weeks ago, I went to visit my aunt in Wimbledon, and I took an Uber um, from the station to my aunt's house and I was chatting to the guy who was driving and it turned out he was a former London Met student who'd done community development and uh, he you know, told me a bit about what he's doing. He's still you know, pursuing his community development interests but he's also making money from driving um, an Uber and then on my way back from my aunt's I took another Uber to get back to the station and uh, I asked the driver there you know, about himself and he said, oh, I was a former London Met student. So I had two Ubers in a row from two graduates of London Met. And um, this, this particular guy said that he'd, this particular guy said that he, um, he, uh, he, he'd, he'd, he was not just driving the car, but he was, he'd, he'd created a startup in um, business to hire Ubers to other people so that there was a lower bar to entry into that. I went to a meeting earlier in the week Actually, it made me think I could have invited all of you, and it was a meeting with the deputy mayor um, who is responsible for communities and making London a better place to live. And one of the things he said, I tweeted what he said, and, and that reminds me to say, feel free to tweet and live tweet what I'm saying now. I, I was in this room with him, and as he was talking, he was saying that people often think of um, data as being a problem to do with, on one hand, if we had access to more data, we would have huge opportunities to change the city for the better. But obviously that's going up against the problem of individual privacy. And in a way we've been sharing that ourselves, haven't we? I'm encouraging you to share your data and you may well be concerned about your privacy. So we've, we've been mirroring that concern. But he said, actually that's not the main concern. From his point of view, as somebody at the you know, sharp end of governing London, he's, he's, he thinks the bigger concern is between the benefits that you can derive from sharing data. So for example, if you have data about health, you can potentially know where the, what the patterns of ill health are and do something about them, versus the fact that the city could be under attack through cyber security attacks if the city is too open about its data. So I thought that was quite an interesting insight that he was challenging the kind of received wisdom that says that you know it's all about tensions between access and individual privacy. He was saying actually it's about governments thinking about how open do they want to be on one hand and how secure do they need to be to protect their populations on the other. But um, oh, a squirrel. Um, 
if you want to have a look at these yourself, the, the way to do it, and I'll try and put a link to this up on the WebLearn site, but just search for Studying London in the Twitter search area without putting the at in front of it. So just do Studying London without the at, and you will just get a list of all of the tweets that mention Studying London. So these are the things that you should have done up till now. Set up a Twitter account, if you wanted to. Um, blogged a story about your locality. Um, we did that in the workshop in week one. For homework in week one, we said tweet or blog 10 photos of your locality. I think I've mentioned this before. Some of you put the pictures up in a blog post and you could see them. But other people um, just put links to the pictures, which means that it's a bit difficult to see them in the blog post. So could you, if you have done it that way, could you redo those blog posts so that we can actually see the pictures without having to click the links? Um, then in week two, um, the idea was to try to make some connections between the places that you were photographing in week one and the locations of TV or film or in particular literature, the locations in which um, stories had taken place, to try to make maybe a connection between fiction or journalism and your own experiences and to practice the process of linking out from a blog post of yours to content that's outside in the outside world. And we did a bit of work on how to do that technically. And then for the homework for week two, I asked you to document a walk um, with photos, maps, tweets. And in a way, what I did last night when I came home from this meeting, I didn't do a walk, I did a forest bike ride. But I, you know, I did a, whatever it was, a, a one and a half hour cycle ride. And all the way on that journey, I was stopping, taking photographs. And I've, in a way, I've only started. I've done about a fifth of the journey so far. I've sent about 10 tweets, but I, I want to do many more because there were other really interesting things that happened along the way, and I took probably 100 photos just snapping things that I saw along the way. And, and then it takes a bit of time to think about, well, I'm going to post a photo, but what shall I say about it? How shall I make it interesting? How shall I connect it to my life? And you know, it's amazing. As I was making that journey, you know, I just passed places that I worked 30 years ago. Um, I, I cycled round Marble Arch, which was in Trevor's lecture last week. Um, I'm trying to think of other interesting things that happened. Um, I went past one of the buildings where I used to go to college um, when I was at university. So I just think those journeys, it's surprising how, without planning them, things that are meaningful turn up. So you should have done that up till now. If you haven't been keeping up, it's, it's fine, it's not too late, just catch up is what I would say. Um, and the idea is that as you accumulate all this material, that's the material that we're going to be assessing you on. So you're doing the assessment as you go. Um, and of course, if you think that there are things you'd like to change or improve, it's always possible to go back and tweak the work that you've done already. You can go back and re-edit your blogs. Okay, so this week I wanted to talk about uh, the index of multiple deprivation, um, commonly known as the IMDB. Can you read this at the back? Can you see it? Um, it's the official measure of relative deprivation for small areas in England. It's the most widely used of the indices of deprivation. Um, so there are 32,844 of them, of these little areas. That the, it's really the national census that defines them. Um, and each one of those areas can be measured in terms of the level of so-called deprivation. And deprivation is measured, I'll explain it a bit more in a minute, on the basis of a number of different factors. Um, I think it'd probably be good if I just take you to one of the links. Um, let's have a look at, uh, if I have a look at this one. So that is a map of the levels of deprivation in London. And can you see that they're, they're everywhere's color coded? So you've got red areas and green areas. Would you like to make any, oh, and red is most deprived and green is least deprived. Would you like to make any comments about how deprivation is distributed across London from that map? It's condensed in the inner city. I think that's absolutely true. Anything else? Is it only that? Is that the only thing you can say in terms of the way that the red areas are distributed? 
you, must, you can definitely say more than that. There's something really startling. It's more in the east. So that area there has a much higher density of areas of deprivation. And actually, it's kind of particularly there, which is Tower Hamlets, Newham, Havering. Um, whereas, you know, if you go out to places like Epsom um, or Wimbledon, um, you know, you get dense areas of very low levels of deprivation. And um, one of the amazing things about this is that you can put in your postcode. That's mine. And it will take me straight down to the roads around where I live. So that's, that's my road. And you can see from the orange there, if I, if I hover the mouse over there, you can see that I live on a road which is ranked in the top 40% of all areas in the country for deprivation. But I'm surrounded by areas with, with many that are amongst the highest levels of deprivation. I think that's, you know, it's a, it's a sometimes some people might think a surprising thing to know that in what should be or what we understand to be a very wealthy city that there are, are these very, very high levels of deprivation. Um, so, just to remind you that, actually, if I, if I, um, if I just take my, myself back along my journey that I made last night on my bike, um, there's Sloan Square, and that's where I went to, um, to, the, to the event that I attended. So I'm actually going to take a screenshot of that. Do you remember how to do it? What do I do? You go to the magnifying glass. You type SNP. This is if you're doing it on a, on a PC. If you're doing it on a phone, I guess you probably know how to do a screenshot. So I can say make a new image. And then I have to drag a box across the area that I'm interested in. I've slightly lost track of where I am. There we are. So that's where I went last night. And then I can save it. So if I say this is the King's Road, made in Chelsea, right? Um, and then at the end of my journey, when I went on my bike, I was up in Islington, and I was at the Angel, which is, where are we? I think it's, oh, here we are. It's here. So that's, that's the place that I ended my journey. So I'm going to take a, a screenshot of that. And then I'm going to tweet those two but I, I could put them in my in my blog on WebLearn equally well, but I'm just going to tweet them now because I want to um, um, connect them to the journey that I did yesterday. So um, Does that make sense, what I've written there? Can you read it? Can you see it? Please just shout out if it's not visible. You can see it now, right? Okay, sorry, I don't know how to, oh, there we are. Okay, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to my photos, and there are my two photos. Now, I want to, I've said that the King's Road is first, because that was the beginning of my journey. So if I open that one, and then if I go again and add a second one, so that really does make the contrast, would you agree, in the way that I've just combined those photographs? 
Um, now, what, what's wrong with my tweet? That's not what? Yeah, you're right. So I need to say studying London. And I'm run out of space. Um, now, I'm thinking I could, instead of having indices of multiple deprivation, if I say IMD, sorry, somebody was just going to suggest that to me, um, I think I'd like to put the link to the map in that I got it from. That would make sense. Would you agree? So if I go here and copy the link, I can put the link into my tweet because then I'm connecting people up to the information that all of this came from. So I've got a little bit of a narrative. It's connected to my journey. I've got two pictures that very clearly show a contrast between west and east and southwest and northeast of London. Um, what do I need to change? Here is the IMDB map for the King's Road first and Angel, Angel second. Um, the, if I say, I'm, I think I might just say start and end points for my studying London trip last night. How does that, how, what do you think of that? It's too long, I know, but it, that, that kind of gets the message across. And I quite like the way that I've woven. I like, ideally, one should try to weave in the at studying London into the narrative rather than just tacking it on the end, if you can. What, how could I just reduce something? Oh, I know. Tell me. What am I going to do? Thank you. OK, so I'll put four there. I'm not that keen on doing that, but, but I'll do it. Uh, and and may, I quite like doing plus instead of and. What else could I do? What, yeah, so if I go map for the King's Road to Angel, um, start and end points for my studying London trip last night. Does that make sense? Okay, and actually, because of that, I feel I can go back to that. All right. Oh, what did I do? Okay. Okay, and so then, if I, if I research for studying London, five new results. Connor, Connor's been tweeting while we've been talking, but okay, my looks like my tweet hasn't come up yet. Anyway, you get the idea. Actually, how can I do this? If I go here, I should see it, shouldn't I? If I go to my own profile, here we go. That's what my tweet looks like. So this idea that you can start to analyze what's happening behind the scenes, behind closed doors of the places that you're photographing, I think is really important to be able to delve into the evidence that underlies what we see on the surface in the city. And I, I want you to try to do that today. Create some screenshots of the places that you know and see what's actually happening. Now, let me s tell you a bit more about the indices of deprivation, if I can find my, I need to go back to try to find my text. Here we go. So, um, so there are various domains in which the government measure deprivation, or the National Office of Statistics measure deprivation, and they do it on the basis of income. And this is all information gathered from the um, censuses that take place, and, and I guess from other information like the tax office would, would hold information about income. So there's, there's low levels of income, there is high levels of unemployment, there are um, low levels of access to education, skills and training, but also areas of the country in which the population don't have high levels of qualifications. So actually London, one of the amazing things about London is that it has one of the highest levels of education of anywhere in the country. Um, so in general, education in London is low in terms of deprivation, even in areas where there may be high levels of unemployment or low levels of income. Education qualification levels will still be pretty high. But the, the idea is that the multiple index, the index of multiple deprivations, is a combination of all of these factors with a contribution to each of the factors in the following percentages. So then there's health, deprivation, and disability. 
So how much access is there to healthcare? If you live somewhere in the country and you don't have, you know, the nearest hospital is 30 miles away, that might be deemed to be something that would have a negative impact on health and would represent a level of health deprivation. Or it could be that the incidence of diseases that we might consider should be eradicated in the 21st century are still quite prevalent in particular locations. The, L London is very mixed in terms of its communities, isn't it? So there are large areas of public housing and social housing mixed in with private housing. And the proportions, are often the, the public housing outnumbers, or the population in the public housing outnumbers the population in the private housing. So although you might have houses worth a million and a half um, in the same location as high levels of deprivation, it's that you're looking at different groups potentially in the same street. I, th I think one of the things that drives private house prices is absolutely what the education is like in the local area because people with families who can afford to move in will move to the places where schools are deemed to be good. I think that, I think that there are complex um, processes taking place that, and, and lots of interactions. And in a way, as, as social scientists, we should be saying, you know, we're, we're going to be critical and we're not just going to, you know, look for simple answers or solutions to these questions but we need to delve into the data, read the academic literature that tries to explain these deep processes that are going on because we can, we can speculate, can't we? Um, and we can see the visual evidence now with this kind of data. But you know, that we, whenever there are complex factors involved, you can never actually say that there is one specific cause. And we need to be very careful about making those kinds of claims. I, th I think th that's a big lesson for us. You know, when we go into the workplace, we need to be making decisions based on data and based on evidence because the decisions that you'll be making in your future careers will have an impact on the lives of the population in these localities. So, you know, the direction of deprivation could be um, in your hands and that makes it extremely important that you are looking for the deep explanations rather than the surface explanations. You get the, you get the rough idea though, what else have we got? Crime, barriers to housing and services, and then, and then there's a living environment, so that might be things like pollution. So anyway, all of these factors are pulled together into these, into these measures. And then I just wanted to say something about the, the way that the, they're called LSOAs, lower layer super output areas. What a mouthful. That's why they're called LSOAs. But they are each of the little areas that have a specific level of deprivation associated with them. So if we go back to the map, um, if I can remember where I put it, which I don't seem to be able to. There we are. So you, can, you can't see it all that well here, but you, you kind of know that anywhere that's got all the same color must be, or where the color changes, that's a boundary between a local area. And did you see on my, on my note there that it says, oops, there, it says that each local area has approximately 1,500 residents and 650 households. So that's what each of these areas contains. And then the, the, the way this works is, um, you know, if you talk about deprivation, it's all about the relative relationship between one area and another. Nobody's saying that one area is deprived and another area isn't deprived. It's about saying you can say that there's something called deprivation and then you can measure it and then you can rank all the areas in the country, and remember what I said, there are 32,000 areas in the country, and you can say this area is the least deprived and this area is the most deprived. So you can rank them into order. So when you see the numbers on the map, there, or let me just make this a bit bigger so you can see it. So when you see those numbers um, on the map, an area that's the darkest red means that it's an area that is in the top 10% of areas for the highest level of deprivation. So how many areas are there altogether? Did I say? How many? 32,000. So how many areas in the country are in the most deprived decile? Th exactly, 3,000, so it's 10%. So just to be clear, you know, there will be all kinds of differences. These are averages. So it doesn't mean to say that there's not somebody who might be deemed individually to have a very low level of deprivation living here and somebody who might be deemed 
to have a high, to experience a high level of deprivation living here. These are averages across areas, and then all of the areas are ranked into order. So I just wanted you to understand a bit about how that works. In, in the document that, I've, that I'm talking from today, there's a link to a much deeper explanation of the sources of the data. But for example, the tax office know the tax that everybody pays in the country, and they know everybody's postcode. So they would anonymize tax data, and they could say what the levels of income are in a particular location. So that might be the way that they would measure income. It would, it would come from government information about income levels, and that would be information that would exist at any moment in time fairly live, wouldn't it, because the tax office are constantly processing information about income. Does, does, that, does that answer that question? I'm not, I, I can't say, I mean, oh, let, let's think about crime. So crime is reported to the police service, so the levels of crime are the levels that are probably reported crime, um, that, that, and it's statistics that are held by the police. Of course, that doesn't mean to say that the crimes that are reported are the crimes that matter or even the, all the crimes that take place. In fact, there would be evidence to suggest that um, you know, maybe areas with high levels of deprivation might not be rep reporting crime as much as they should because people are just thinking, what's the point, and we don't trust the police, um, and they won't do anything about it anyway. So the, this data is not definitive, but it, it's a, you know, an approach to trying to measure as best we can. Does that answer your question? So if you want to know precisely what the sources of the data are for each of the different measures, you can delve into that, and it's all documented. So there was a census in 2011 where everybody gets answered, gets asked questions like, you know, what's your religion, what, what's your country of birth, things like that. Um, so that's only once every 10 years. But then obviously income would be measured constantly because the tax office are always receiving information about the tax that people are paying. Crime figures are released every month, I think. So there are different cuts of the data for different periods of time. I've chosen 2010, actually just because I had a link to it. There's another one of these for 2015. Yep. And you would find that for different sources of data, you, you need to kind of look and see what the dates are. So actually, when I did my tweets, I should really have said what the date was because, in fact, it, in the last five years, it could have changed. So that was a kind of... I mean, I'm, I'm under pressure because I'm doing it in front of you, but if I'd had a bit more time, I would have thought more carefully about using the, the latest data rather than this slightly out-of-date data. One of the interesting things about this is that there's actually a way of looking at it where you can see um, it color coding for whether things are going up or down. So that's really quite interesting. How are things changing over time? Very, very interesting thing to look at. So let's just have a look at some of my links. I, th this, these are links that have taken me, you know, years in a way to gather um, and you know somebody just said um, you were just saying you weren't you know people aren't aware of this data existing you didn't know about it before house buyers might not know about it I, I just think it is absolutely astounding data and um, I, as we look through it now I, I, I think you will well, you ought to be really excited about the possibilities that this data provides to understand what's going on because it exists in lots of different dimensions so let me show you some of it um, so if I look at this one, this is the 2015 data on IMD. Um, it's a different map, a different website, but accessing the same underlying data. I don't like it as much visually. One amazing thing is, of course, it shows the whole country. Um, and in fact, it's quite interesting to think about how deprivation is distributed across the country. Whoops, oh, that zoomed me in more quickly than I was expecting. Yeah, that, that kind of shows it a bit. You know, you can see that cities um, are similar in terms of them being places where high levels of deprivation are con uh, concentrated. But this is the same view, really, as we had from the other map albeit we're looking at 2015 and it's a different representation. It's a bit harder to see the streets, so I kind of prefer the other view. Um, but one of the nice things about this is you can very easily switch into the different kinds of deprivation and also you can see the local areas more clearly. So do you see here there's a blue line that cl clearly delineates the 
LSOA, the local area. But if I click here, um, let me just think. We're looking at London. We can see that west-east split of high levels of deprivation, lower levels of deprivation, can't we? But let's do it for education. Um, if I can work out which of there. There's education. So let's see what that does to the color map. What's happened? So this is, ed this is deprivation according to education, and this is overall deprivation. And we talked about this, didn't we, in the first week? We, we, there was a bit of a controversial exchange that um, actually I had with you, Stephanie, where you said, why was I so astounded that um, working class children in London have a higher standard or have a higher achievement in their education than middle class children <coughs> um, in other parts of the country? And I, you know, I said it was shocking. And you, you said, why should that be shocking? And I think, you know, if I was saying, um, why should working class children achieve well? That would have been a shocking thing to say, but I was really talking about, um, you know, it, it's a sign that there is tremendous inequality of distribution of good quality education across the country, and that's the thing that I was saying was shocking. But I think all of that is reflected in this map because clearly London as a whole is seen as very deprived, but actually for education, it's not. So that, that is, you know, we can see that very, very clearly in the contrast between those two bits of data because if education was following suit of other kinds of deprivation, you would expect that when you click on the, on the education map, the color distribution would be the same. Should we have a look for employment? So employment's kind of similar. Income, you'd expect to be similar. Health, London's doing quite well in terms of health by the looks of it. Crime, whoa. <laughs> and what about housing? What do you reckon it's going to be for housing? Any guesses? The same, the same as crime. So what is housing deprivation like? That will be very interesting to see. You're right. Congratulations. Living environment. Any thoughts about that? I think it, I, I would think of it as um, you know the quality of the built environment. The um, the uh, maybe it could be to do with the standard of roads, the number of potholes. You know the, the government are gathering information that measures its performance. Pollution levels would be a big one. Um, uh, so should we have a quick look? Living environment. Well, that's what, what does that tell you? Yeah, so I mean, I think that makes me think without, because I don't know the detail of every single one of these measures, I would speculate that it's pollution that is the key factor in measuring deprivation according to living environment. Because, and I can tell you this, when I, when I got on my bike, are you okay over there? When I, when I got on my bike yesterday, you know, it, it's, London feels to me to be getting more and more polluted. Um, the number of instances where I could just shoot through my bike past, past traffic that was at a standstill was quite surprising and, and very satisfying, actually. Um, what else have we got? Oh, deprivation affecting children. So that's quite similar to, to general deprivation. And then um, deprivation affecting older people. So it's really interesting information, I think, and you can see it down to street level for your particular street. You can put your postcode in here and it will take you down. It's a little bit harder to see, as I was saying, until you get down to a deep level, it's a bit hard to find the roads because they, do you see what I mean? They, it's all a bit dimmed out because of the color coding, but you can actually see it. So again, look at this find something interesting, find something that surprises you about your neighborhood. Maybe think, this is not what I'm seeing. I don't agree with this. It doesn't reflect my experience. These are all the kinds of things that I think you could be thinking about. Um, and then screenshot and post them to your blog. And maybe you could post an image alongside a map and see whether the visual surface 
is matching up to what the data is telling you? Are there signs from what you can see when you stand there in the street and take a photograph of the things that are reflected in the data? Or does the, does the appearance contrast with what the data is telling you? I think these are interesting things to think about. OK, going back to my notes, um, I'm going to just rattle you through um, some of the other data. So just reminding you that there's this data, this form of the data. It's the same as the other map that we were just looking at, but just presented in a slightly different format. You can see it for 2015 and for 2010. Um, uh, oh, this is, the, this is the one that is um, showing you changes. So how has the rank changed between 2010 and 2015? So how many places has a particular local area moved up or down the ranking. And I think that's very interesting. So you can see, for example, you, you click over here, you can choose to see um, how, is, how has education changed? And if you look there, what, what does that tell you about education change? Blue means that, um, let me just get this straight, I think blue is good and red is bad. So what's happened to education in London? It's got better where? In the south and in the center and in the east, would you say, or here? Here it's looking more blue. Here, up in the north and the west, it's looking like it's got worse. So that's quite interesting. Tells you what's going on over time. Um, then we've got, let's see this one. Oh, this is fantastic. Here is the Mayor of London's data store. And it contains spreadsheets that tell you about all of these things. So if you're asking where the deprivation data comes from, it's this kind of data that it would be drawn from. And you can actually download the spreadsheets and see the raw data about what's happening. Interesting things and loads of different data sets. Um, I, I encourage you to explore those. Some of them won't be there as maps. They'll be there just as, as I said, spreadsheets. What's this one? Oh, just to remind you that um, you know this, this data on CDRC um, has so many different ways of measuring things. And this is to do with country of birth. So I think that's quite interesting, a way of seeing the city in terms of where people were born. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but you might want to have a look at that and see what it tells you about your street and whether it matches up to what you know about your area. Um, what else have we got here? Oh, OK, so this is some enthusiast for maps of London who's made a website that tries to bring together all of the interesting maps of London. Um, Let's see if there are any there. Some of these are quite funny. Can you see them? Oh, second language is spoken. Wait, the ways that people travel to work. Um, the GCSE scores. Um, murder map. I was, um, I walked, do you remember I said that, um, about this story about Dickens um, and, and Oliver Twist and the Artful Dodger walking along a path? that um, was on my route that I told about in my story. So I went there on my bike ride last night. And as I was passing that little side road, little side passage, a group of people came out of the pub. And, and there were about five or six of them. They walked down this little passage. And one of them said to the other one, is this where you're going to murder me? Um, so, uh, I, don't know, I just thought that was, uh, it was, it was funny. That, you know, there I was, randomly in the street. And I hear this, you know, a kind of throwback to the sense that people have of what London used to be like in the days of, the, you know, Victorian crime. Anyway, interesting, interesting, interesting maps there. And let me see what else we've got. Um, okay, this is called the UK Data Explorer, and this will show you the distribution of religion practiced or no religion practiced, the ethnicity that people identify with, and you can um, choose the data that you want to display. And it has, this is from the census. So I think this is from the, 20, yeah, the 2011 census, the one that's done every year. I don't know if you can see all those things in there. But look, look, just the idea that you can get a map of London that will tell you about each of these categories. So you want to know where do the Buddhists live in, Lo in London? That's where they live. It's astounding. And you can screenshot it and blog about it. Um, and oh, by the way, last week, you remember, um, I invited you to share some information about yourselves. And then this is the result. 
So you mapped yourselves, and if you, not everybody did it, but you could do it today if you haven't done it already. So what have we got here? We've got, uh, um, I'm just trying to think what these, what the colors mean. Oh, here we go. So, so we've got, um, th this color is Christianity. Um, yellow is other religion. Red is no religion. Um, blue is Islam. And then the numbers link to ethnicity. So I think that's, again, quite interesting. Quite interesting to think about whether you, as a group, follow the patterns that you can find from the wider data about London. You might like to think about that. Um, so that's it. So then I'm saying what you're going to do in the seminar and what you're going to do for homework. So in the seminar, you're going to post tweets with photos or screenshots of links between places, the appearance of places, and the underlying social factors that you can discern from the data. Um, particularly, I think you should be looking at using the IMD data. Um, if you want to reuse your previous material to create new blog posts, there's nothing wrong with reusing the same images that you already have. I did an example of this. I don't know if people have looked at it. So this is, this is the blog that I prepared when I taught this module before. And you know, I've, I've done another journey on this blog. You have to wait for the tweets to pop up. So I've embedded my tweets. There's a journey. And I'm talking about you know, what's happening in terms of the various data sets that tell us about levels of deprivation. And then I'm telling, you know, I've got a little photo essay, really, about what I saw along the way. And I'm trying to pick up some of the themes that I think are interesting when it comes to studying the city. So that's the kind of thing that I'm looking for you to do. You know, screenshot the pictures of the places with the IMD data. Um, so that's my example of what I'd like you to do. Um, for homework, what we're saying this week is that we're just asking you to look at what other people are doing. Follow them on Twitter, retweet them, or if you're not using Twitter, comment on people's blog posts, read other people's blog posts, see if you can find connections, see if you can find things that maybe you don't agree with that somebody has suggested in a blog post that they've made, and say what you think an alternative interpretation might be. So that, those are the kinds of things we'd like you to do for homework. By the end of, um, or by, by this time next week, you should have posted at least 10 really good, meaningful comments into the um, posts of somebody else in your group. Um, and I just wanted to mention this. Um, in, um, uh, in about a month's time, 600 employers and web developers who use a blogging tool called WordPress, which is what about a quarter of the web is built on. It's the technology that make about a quarter of the web's websites. That conference is being held at the university, and they're, they're basically taking over the whole of the university for this conference. And um, if you would be interested in attending it, you know, it's attended by people who blog professionally from lots of different disciplines, as well as lots of techie people who are interested in data and interested in how to make the world a better place through data. Um, if you would like to come and, you, and you've got ten pounds, um, there's a twenty percent, uh, sorry, a twenty pound discount, and you just need to use that that code. I'll be there at that conference all weekend, Saturday and Sunday. So it's ten pounds for food all through the weekend. So it's good, really good value and amazing, an amazing conference and quite a good thing to you know, witness, to start thinking about how you want to engage um, with, a, with a professional group. And then I just said that um, I mentioned that uh, there's further reading. Um, so if you want to delve further into where all that IMD data comes from, as you were asking, you can find out more about it by reading this link.